Hi there, I'm Clint Simone, the associate editor and video producer of Motor1.com, and welcome to this week's edition of the Motor1.com podcast. Today we'll be discussing a topic that really seems to be gaining in popularity year after year, and that's overlanding, and more specifically, the Overland Expo. And after that, we're going to dive into some recent news stories. We're talking super power figures and crossover coupes. But I'm not here alone. Joining me this week is Motor1.com writer and resident South Dakota expert, Mr. Chris Smith. How's it going, Chris? What up? How are we doing? Cold. Cold. Well, we're happy to have you here either way. And joining me in studio here in Miami is Motor1.com senior editor, who also just adopted a cat, Jeff Perez. How you doing, Jeff? Good. How you doing, guys? So we should probably talk about the cat, but instead maybe we stick in our lane and, and talk about things we know more. Uh, and that is cars. So diving right into it, let's talk Overland Expo. I had the pleasure of attending Overland Expo West. That was last week, an event in northern Arizona. Uh, and it was really my first exposure to this overlanding trend, overlanding community, whatever you want to call it. First of all, what an event. Like so much fun, so many different people, so many different cars. You could be there for three days um, and really not see everything. But it, it brings up this bigger topic of overlanding vehicles and just how damn fun they are, how cool it is to see uh, what people throw together. So to open up this topic, I'd like to ask you both, um, what's your opinion on overlanding and, and how it's gaining in popularity? Chris, let's start with you. Well, I might show my age a little bit here, but I remember back uh, as a kid in the 80s when when vans and, and conversion vans were just everywhere, and it was epic, and it was awesome, and now we're seeing it go a step further where, okay, you're not just driving your van to like a rest area or a campground. You're going like absolutely where there are no roads at all, and I love it. I I think it's... It's a sign of the times that people are really, really craving just an avenue to get away from things and not just go to a normal campground, but like go explore places where you might even have a little trouble hiking. So you have these crazy uh, you know, Jeeps and, and gosh, the, the Mercedes Unimogs that are built up as these insane overlanders. I'm actually really jealous of a lot of these guys that um, that build these vehicles that get them and then they just they sell their house and it's like that's it and they're just off the grid and thing is though they're not even really off the grid i've seen so many vans and so many conversions where they have their little office set up and you know as long as you have a decent cell signal somewhere if you have like a satellite internet service i mean you're off the grid but you're not really i mean you know what i'm saying um i mean i did a story a few weeks back of a guy that had a huge mountain biker. Uh, he's over on the West Coast, and he basically sold his house, and he got this older, um, it was a Dodge Sprinter, technically still a Mercedes Sprinter, but uh, you know a big Dodge Sprinter, an older one that he converted up himself. He put a little garage in the back. In this case, he's not hauling cars. It was a little garage workshop for his mountain bikes, and he has a mountain bike company and he still works with clients. He's just on the road. He's, doing he's like, mobile. yeah, he's like, you know, I spent so much time out, you know, away from my house anyways. I might be home, you know, like three or four times a month. It's like, let's just go on the road. So, I mean, he's out doing his mountain biking thing, running his business out of this freaking Mercedes. Right. I like having space. I have a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm a collector of many strange and odd items. So I would fill up the space pretty quick, but I'm extremely jealous of the people that can let go of a lot of that materialistic stuff and go out and just have a good time. But and the storage I, solutions I, I, I saw it. in person were insane now that you mention it. And people find ways to put places and store them properly that you just didn't think was possible. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, you have to be creative in, a, in an environment like that. You have to try to find the best use of every single space square inch possible and uh, i mean it's it's inspiring to me i think i'd love it i do like the point you bring up though of this has sort of evolved you know decade after decade and it's not just giant traditional rvs people are getting creative now um i think we posted a story this week of a porsche 996 that had the overland tent on top of it and people are kind of taking it on this i call it like an instagram adventure where they're posting just <laughs> elaborate photos of this car all over the place um 
and how could you not love that? It's alternative, it's fun, and I love this sort of overlanding spirit where people take fill in the blank car, make it their own, and just go for it. And that was a really interesting story because I wrote that one up. Um, the gentleman's name, uh, he, he's over in Oregon. Um, Brock Keen, I think is his name. And it was sort of an accident how he came about with that. He's a big you know, camper guy. Um, you know, him and his wife love to go out, do the thing. And he made sort of an impulse purchase of this rooftop tent. I think he had a Land Rover that he was going to put it on, but it, it was going to take some extra gear to get it to fit. He, in the meantime, has a 996, 911 with a, uh, with a roof rack on it that he would haul some things on. It's, it's, it's a daily for him. And he realized, you know, this, this tent actually kind of fits better on top of the Porsche. So that's how we got it home. Did a little bit more work there to make sure that the Porsche could actually handle the the tent and the weight up on top. And yeah, it does. And so here you have a 996, 911. That's, you know, instead of going out and doing the kind of traditional overlanding thing where you're going to climb canyons with your uh, with your big off-roader, he's out carving canyons. And, and, then, and then when he gets to it, you know, fairly level spot i mean it's it's still a 911 it's a carrera 4 well you got to go safari build with that over time right <laughs> i would love to see a safari overlanding 911 that would be epic yeah well we're giving him a little inspiration jeff you went to the event last year you know again when it's still very popular tell us what you thought and now you know what do you think of this trend growing more yeah i think it was 2 years ago at this point uh either way i was there with nissan and uh I was actually kind of overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that was there. Like, I was not expecting the amount of people, first of all, that just brought their overlanders there. So, the parking lot, so like a lot of concourse events where you go to the parking lot and find the coolest cars for like p- that people actually drive, this is kind of the same thing, right? You go to the parking lot and you see all the crazy overland builds that the people drove to the event. Um, <clears throat> but then the actual event is just like, Everything is everywhere. I mean, there's there's little cohesion to it, but it's just so much cool stuff. You know, you have like big companies like Earthroam are there. I think when I was there, they debuted their um, like one million dollar uh, Overlander, which is just a luxury apartment on an F uh, Ford F class, you know, chassis or whatever it is. Um, it's crazy. I mean, I think Overlanding in general, to Chris's point, has always been around. Um, but sort of hipster millennial Instagrammers have taken it over and they make it a big point to, you know, drop everything, get in a van, get in a Mercedes Sprinter or whatever, and make that their life, which again, I admire, like that's crazy. I could never do that. Um, but it is a growing trend and this Overland Expo is just a huge event that's getting bigger every year. The Instagram community will will not go away. You're right about that. They have taken it over. But what they haven't done, at least that I've seen, is sort of change the spirit of the whole thing, which is take your car, uh, cheap, expensive, somewhere in between, and just kind of go crazy with it. You mentioned Nissan. I traveled with them this year, uh, and they debuted that Destination Frontier. So, you know, it's a truck that you don't immediately think about the frontier. It's pretty old at this point, but they took about 10 grand worth of parts, um, putting the truck with all the things on it, about 40 grand out the door, which is entry level full size pickup territory, if you will. And it just works. It was fun. It was fun to play around in the dirt. And, and behind that truck is sort of this notion of you don't have to spend 50 grand, 80 grand, 100 grand to have this overland truck of your dreams. You can kind of just go with it. And I will say Nissan for all its faults of its trucks, they've done a really good job of making them both the Frontier and the Titan sort of overland specials, right? So you don't really see that with Ford, the F-150. You don't really see that with the newer Rams, though there are a lot of older overland Rams, which I think is kind of interesting. But Nissan has done a really good job of using the Titan especially as a good platform for overlanding. Uh, and and when I was there a few years ago, they debuted Project Basecamp, which I think was one of their first... Uh, special projects on Titan and they gave us the whole you know gamut showing us what it can do how versatile it actually is and that you can genuinely live in this thing you know forever theoretically Um, so it's interesting especially how Nissan has taken on a role as overlanding now that 
Chris and I talked about it. I can't get the idea of the Safari build Overland 996 out of my head. But I have to ask, uh, and I can start here, um, seeing all these trucks lined up next to each other, what is your dream Overland vehicle? I found in a row maybe seven of these, and I hadn't forgotten, or excuse me, I hadn't thought about these cars in a while. But the, the older gen Lexus GX 470s, that in the time sort of roamed suburban neighborhoods. And now they're just cheap enough, I think, where people are putting 10, 15 grand into them, lifting them, and just making them look mean and awesome. And I found them, and that's at the top of my mind now. Chris, what's your dream Overland vehicle? Oh, man. I mean, that's like saying, which finger do you want to cut off? It's uh, it's so hard to narrow down because I think, I, I think there are – Overlanding in general is a thing. But then there are different kind of categories in there. I mean, to start with, I would love to have one of the, just the huge Unimog based go anywhere freaking six by six. You know, it doesn't matter if there's a boulder or a house in front of you. <laughs> you just you just roll over it and it's still quite roomy inside with a nice big bed, lots of a uh, lots of amenities. That's one end that I would really like. Um if I had your to point choose earlier, one, that's sort of the the modify your lifestyle, pick up and go scenario compared to your more just hey, let's use it on right. the weekend for time to time, cheap build. Right. The the thing I like about like the really big ones, like the, you know the Unimog based stuff, they carry so much water. They carry they carry so much that you really need for an extended expedition. I mean, that's I guess if if you had to break it down that way, that would be like the ultimate expedition vehicle. But on the other end, I mean, something like that, like that 911. I mean, man, you should not have said Safari 911 because I already want to take my Mustang and make a Safari Mustang. Now I'm thinking Safari 911 with a tent on the roof would be epic. Is Safari Mustang and a thing? No, <laughs> <laughs> I, I have I have seen them from time to time, um, but but no, they're they're not really a thing. But then again, they could be with the uh, with the overlanding trend. You know, how hard would it be to put a, a tent on top of a Mustang? Didn't you find one of these on Craigslist recently? I don't know if I would call it a Safari Mustang, but it was something that you could absolutely run over things with and you wouldn't hurt the car, put it that way. Yes, there was one for sale, um, again, over in, uh, I think it was in Oregon. That, uh, and it was even a convertible. So, I mean, that was that was awesome. Um, to jump back to the to the Overland issue, though, the the topic there. I've always been kind of a traditional camper where, you know what, you, you go to the to the RV parks or the campgrounds and you know everybody's got their trailer or their RV. And I was always the one, you know, hoofing it in with like a small two person tent that right, maybe right. one person could fit in. So where where the Unimog is on one end, I gotta say, you know, just something really bare bones like that nine nine six, nine eleven with a roof. Uh, with a tent on the roof, or even like uh, like like an old old uh, VW, an old bus. I mean, I I think that would be an epic adventure just to do something in a small bus like that. That's kind of where I stand on it. Yeah, or a Mustang with a tent on the roof. I'd really like to see the latter, for being honest. <laughs> I think we can make that happen over time. Uh, Jeff, let's toss it over to you. What is your dream Overland vehicle of the moment? I kind of have two, uh, and they're both sort of on opposite ends of the spectrum. The first one is one that I've actually driven. Um, Volkswagen has a T6 California, I think it's called, in Europe. And it's uh, it's sort of like a modern interpretation of the you know classic VW bus. But if you spec it as it was specced, uh, the way we drove it, it's fully loaded. It has a shower, a sink, you know, whatever you need. And it, you can sleep like two and a half people in there. It's, it's a huge cabin. And what kind of stunk, though, was on that drive they shipped, I don't know, maybe 10 or 15 of these buses to California where you can't buy them in the U.S. because they're only European, which is kind of like a tease. But we drove up the uh, Pacific Coast Highway and there were so many people that stopped me and stopped people in our group and said, wow, when is Volkswagen going to sell this? I want this. I want to buy this. There was a guy in the parking lot of a grocery store that had a huge Sprinter uh, overland vehicle fully decked out and he said hey can I check out the inside of your bus if you want to check out the inside of my sprinter and I said yeah sure and it was you know just like he was so excited by the 
thought of having one of these buses. It was great. So that's that's my first one, and I think it's the more reasonable choice. Um, my next one... That preface scares me, by the way. <laughs> it's not... I won't say that this one isn't super unreasonable, but I don't think I've seen it. Um, a Ford Raptor, which... I think makes sense to an extent, right? Because that truck can do anything. Uh, it just needs some really heavy modification to make the bed into an actual, you know, sleeping quarter, um, and just some other minor stuff, minor livable day-to-day stuff. But I think the the base is there. I think the Raptor would be great as a base vehicle. Chris, feel free to jump in on this. I guess my only counter argument to that is the starting price of the Raptor, that if you're going to spend all that extra money modifying it anyway, you know, doing new shocks, new tires, modifications to the bed, et cetera, that people might not want to start with the truck that's, you know, 60, almost 70 grand, that you could take a lower spec F-150 and kind of go crazy with that on your own. There are different segments, I think, of, of the overlanding culture. On one end, price, I mean, price is always an object. But dumping high five or, or even six figure sums into an overlander. I mean, I mean, how many uh how many custom defenders have we seen that are like two and three hundred thousand dollars? So I mean, there's there, there's like there's the higher end market that I I agree with Jeff, man. A Raptor makes perfect sense, and I want to say I've seen a a couple um, now and again, but not nearly as many as I would expect. And you're right in that. I mean, this this truck, you don't really need to do anything to the suspension. It's already very, very capable off-road. I mean, maybe give it a little more clearance if you really want to go places where there are no roads at all or no trails or nothing. Um, I'll say, too, that, you know, Raptor's expensive. Um, but Volkswagen told us if we wanted the bus, the California and the U.S., it would be about a hundred grand as it was spec'd the way I was driving it. Right, which is crazy. But then again, if you're dropping everything and you're just gonna live in the bus, hundred grand is is a is a lot to pay for an overlander, but it's not out of this world. You know, it's not outrageous. Um and a raptor I I would say probably would be about the same price once you fit it with everything, maybe a little more. Um so yeah, people spend a lot of money on their overlanders, so it's not that crazy. Right. And and that's another point to consider. For the people that say, you know what, I'm I'm ditching the house and just going on the road, you think, oh, they're going to pay one hundred fifty thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars for that uh, for that vehicle? No, that's their house, and one hundred fifty two hundred thousand dollars for a house isn't really that much, you know. So I mean, yeah. that's it, it. You almost have to unlearn and kind of kind of rethink the whole concept of just you know buying an RV or buying a house. That's that you're going to live in permanently, and and then on the other end of the scale, uh, I mean we've seen so many um, just like small startup companies that are doing things with smaller vans. Um, I mean we've even seen companies that have like like little cubicle boxes that will just slip into the back of a cargo van, and now all of a sudden you have an overlanding vehicle. You're not necessarily going to uh, go crawling over the rocks with it, but um, I mean, if you have something like a Sprinter that has a little bit of ground clearance to it, you plug in one of those modules, it's really not that expensive. And all of a sudden you have a vehicle ready to go. So, I mean, there's there are so many different levels of of the experience that you can have right now. And that's really what's quite fascinating to me through the whole thing. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love with the, the the Raptor how fast it could be. And I think with these vehicles, the issue is not power or weight necessarily as i discovered driving that frontier along it's sometimes the height that you add to the vehicle if you put a giant tent on top of the thing um in northern arizona there was you know 40 mile per hour winds and if you're not careful you can end up with the leaning tower frontier pretty damn quickly (laughs) um but yeah raptor could definitely work out i like where your head is at there no question Um, Hey, here's the good news. The conversation certainly does not end here. We'd love to hear what you think about overlanding. If you have a sweet overlanding rig that you want to share with us, send us a message. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at MotorOne.com, where we're constantly keeping you up to date with what's new. And of course, our website, MotorOne.com, where you can find us in the comments. 
Coming up next, we're going to shift gears and discuss a segment that just won't slow down, for better or for worse. That's crossover coupes, and we're talking Toyota Supra. But before the break, a reminder, please, if you're listening to this online, you can get our show on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Please show us some love and subscribe now so you never miss a show. Welcome back. To wrap things up today, we're going around the horn with two major stories from this last week, starting with a recent car and driver test that showed the Toyota Supra making more power than Toyota claims it does. Toyota is telling us it makes 335 horsepower and 365 pound-feet of torque, and our friends over at Car and Driver put the car on a dyno, uh, and they came out with 339 horsepower and 427 pound-feet. Now, that horsepower jump is negligible. It's very small. Uh, But that's a pretty stark contrast with the torque figure change. Chris, do these findings surprise you? Well, I I think I mentioned it a a couple days ago. I I mean, a Japanese automaker that that is underrating their Halo performance car, that's never happened before. I mean, mean, it's it's, it's such a surprise. You know, I, I mean... When when the new Super came out, I was surprised that it wasn't rated at 276 horsepower. Exactly, because, exactly. You know, so, so I mean, sarcasm aside, no, it doesn't surprise me. What uh, what I am curious about, though, and it's not necessarily just related to Supra, but with all modern cars, because I mean, let's be honest, we haven't seen or we have we've seen this before with other cars, especially uh, probably the, the most famous one being the McLaren 720 S, mm-hmm. um, showing on a dyno that it's just, it's making so much more power than McLaren originally said it was. Um, I'm, I'm starting to wonder because back in the old days, <laughs> old days being not that long ago, when you dyno a car, I mean, you're, you're talking about wheel horsepower, right? And there's always going to be some parasitic power loss, um, from the engine as it goes through the drive line back to the wheels. And if memory serves me correct, the the general percentage that was acceptable for a manual transmission, I think was around 12 or 15% drive line loss and automatics with the torque converter were a little bit higher. Um, but, you know, technology has changed so much. I'm, I'm curious, and I'm not an engineer, so maybe some of our listeners that uh, that have a little more information on this uh, can help us out uh, at MotorOne.com. I wonder if the technology is such where we're seeing less driveline loss now. Um, I mean, I hesitate to say that that all manufacturers are just now naturally underrating their cars just to try to, to one up the other guys. It's certainly nothing new, but I almost wonder the incentive there because I wonder myself, you know, what is the incentive for underrating the power that you're making uh, from an engine? Well, I know. I mean, way, way back before my time, um, it it was really more about insurance than anything. If an insurance company saw that you wanted to insure a car that had 500 horsepower, well, that, that was that was ridiculous and the prices would be much higher. But if that car was rated at say 390 you know mustangs i'm looking at you back back in the uh, muscle car era <laughs> it 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 was a lot more uh, it was a lot more affordable for insurances so uh, i mean there there was that aspect and there was also the aspect of of just trying to one up the other guy oh hey their car is only making 320 horsepower so will build ours to make 340 horsepower and will one up them. Well, that 320 horsepower car maybe was actually making 390 horsepower. You know, it's right. You, you know, a, a, a lot of, a lot of cloak and dagger stuff. Um, but I, I'm, I'm legitimately wondering with so much changing in technology and so much more efficiency at all levels, really of automotive production. If it's, if it's time to take a look at those accepted parameters of you know, around 15% and maybe around 20% or so for automatics, maybe that need to, maybe that needs to be revisited. You know, and it's a, that's right. The, the only other way to do it is, you know, let's just yank the engine out of the super, put it on an engine dyno and see what it makes actually at the crank. I don't see anybody doing that with their super anytime soon. 
I'm sure as people start engine swapping them, you might be surprised people will take the time and do something like that. We know we're not far off of that. Um, It's worth mentioning that that engine is good for more power, and in all likelihood, we're going to see that. We're going to see a hotter version of the Supra. Jeff, you can speak to that a little bit as well. Yeah, well, we already see it on the Z4, right? The Z4 is, I think, 389 at the crank, uh, according to BMW. So it's already putting out more power there. But I will say... Two things, just to clarify. Um, the dyno that Car and Driver ran was 339 horsepower and 427 pound-feet of torque at the wheels, which is insane. That's a crazy number for a Supra, right? Especially when it's rated uh, at 335 at the crank. So you're comparing these numbers and you're saying that's a huge, dramatic difference. Um, but there are two things you really have to think of and take into account is dynos aren't totally accurate every time and I think that I don't want to sit here and say that dynos aren't accurate um, for the most part but I think a lot of times they are a little weird with the numbers they put out Um, and I will also say this is not a slight to Toyota or any other manufacturer that gives us press cars because we greatly appreciate it Um, they could be a little overrated uh, press cars. They could be putting out more power than you will actually get from a production vehicle because we've seen it before with manufacturers that they offer a press vehicle that is better, I guess, in, in different ways than the final product. And I'm not saying that's the case here. I'm not saying that manufacturers do that regularly, but we've seen it. Uh, so it's it's something to think about. But I guess to the bigger point, uh, this is the second time that we've seen something about the Super being underrated because Car and Driver also did a zero to sixty test, which is kind of hard to fib or hard to mess up on the dyno, and it did three point eight seconds versus manufacturer estimate of four point one seconds. And from your first drive, Jeff, because you're really the only one on the team that's driven it thus far, you said you know without question it felt faster to you. It felt fast in the seat. Yeah, it felt really fast. I mean, it's it's crazy to think that 335 horsepower can still feel fast with all the 700, 800 horsepower cars that are out there today. But I've I've haven't felt a car that quick in that class or really in that general you know Venn diagram that includes like Corvette and F-Type. Um, that car is just stupid quick, and it, so it's no surprise to me that it gets to 60 under four seconds. And I'm not shocked to see that the power is more than estimated, even if it's not totally accurate. Do you have either of you any guesses as to what you think that engine can do with proper tuning, even on just Toyota's behalf, before the aftermarket gets a hold of it? Oh, man, on Toyota's behalf, I mean, see, here's where it gets a little sticky because it's no secret they've partnered with BMW, obviously, on the car. So... There's always going to be, I think, that question in a lot of people's minds, how far will BMW let them go? You know, it, you know, I, I think it's I think it's something that that might actually end up being a thing. Uh, we already saw BMW adjust its Z4 performance figures after Toyota announced its super performance figures, um, you know, to make sure I think that the Z4 was just a little bit faster. Um, as far as the capability of the engine, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on that mill yet, but uh, from what I've seen, uh, you know, like especially with some of the, the BMW crowd, it, it's it's terrifically capable. It's terrifically capable of of uh, like 500 plus um, pretty easily. Will we see that in the Supra? I, I highly doubt it. Not um, from Toyota. For, I mean, right. you give this thing to aftermarket companies, tuner shops. I think much like the previous generations of Super, we'll see absolutely monstrous power figures and probably not too far from now, to be honest. There's a GRMN, which is a terrible acronym. R-M-M-M-M-M-M. Yeah, uh, there's a GRMN version supposedly on the way from Toyota. I mean, we probably won't see it for another year or two years. Um, but I don't think that'll be crazy powerful either. I think the the goal with this car is to keep it light, keep it nimble, and anything over... I would say maybe 400, and it would be probably too much to handle. I think 335 is a good number right now. Uh, And like I said, it feels really quick between like first and second gear. So I don't know. It depends. I think this engine is super capable, 
But I also think that because it's a BMW engine that they might hold it back a little bit as not to, you know, kind of stress the partnership, um, knowing that the Z4 is the more powerful of the two. Uh, but I would actually like to see a Z4M. I mean, if they're both going to go crazy with it, why not put an M badge on it? Do you think the cars compete with each other, so to speak? I know it's such a strange question to ask because they're so similar and how they're on the same foundation. So at the event, Toyota made it a point to say that the two main competitors for Super are Cayman, Porsche Cayman, and BMW M2, which is strange considering BMW also builds the Z4 and the two cars are really similar. But I think they made a good point to say that uh, Supra is a real sports car. It's a hard top. It's what you want to take to the track, uh, whereas the Z4 is a little more of a cruiser. It's a convertible. And I think they overlap a little bit, but not enough to where it's uh, jeopardizing to either of them. And Chris, I do love that point you made earlier about let's have somebody get this thing on an engine dyno at some point. I'm, I'm sure we'll see that in the future. I, I think we will. Whether or not the uh, the info gets out, I mean that'll that'll be interesting because you love to hear about um, you know cars that go out on the chassis dyno, you know the the vehicle dyno, and they and they they test power at the wheels. Very seldom do you ever hear anything about um, an actual engine dyno with engine at the crank outside of manufacturers. And I mean, let's be honest. You look back at the A80 Supra. What did that make originally for horsepower? It was, it was like 330, I think. But how many people really know that? Because so many of them went out and and fell into the hands of the aftermarket and were making seven, 800 horsepower. It's like people, people over time forget about what it originally made. It's like, okay, here's what they are making in, in the hands of tuners. So that'll be interesting to see as the car goes forward. And, uh, you know, as far as the BMW Toyota dichotomy there, I, I like to spend a, a fair amount of time on auto forums, and I still see a lot of the Supra purists just fuming furious over BMW's involvement, mm -hmm. while the BMW guys are like, dude, you guys don't even realize how good this car really, you don't realize how good the engine is because all you see is the BMW badge. So going forward, I'm, I'm very interested to see how it all shakes out. I, I can see a point to where Supra guys are like, oh, it's a Z, it's a Z4. But then BMW guys are like, oh, yeah, it's actually a Supra underneath. So, you know, the, Z, the Z4 is actually cool for the first time. Both are good points. Uh, I think I speak for all of us when I say we're excited to see where Supra goes next. That comes both from the Toyota side of things. The car is now in the hands of the aftermarket. If not literally now, then soon enough. So now we wait and see what happens next. Let the engine swaps happen. Let's get to the final item on the menu here today. It's one we don't necessarily love talking about, but I think it's hilarious and it always causes great conversation one way or another. It's crossover coupes. We got to mention them at some point. They're not going away. In fact, they're growing, which is a perfect lead in to the first point I want to make. So we have a Porsche crossover coupe now. Uh, and Jeff, you just drove it. You drove it a couple days ago. Tell us about the Cayenne Coupe. Yeah, the Cayenne Coupe. Man, crossover coupes are, <laughs> there's something. And I don't say that as a slight to the Cayenne Coupe because honestly, that is a fantastic vehicle. Like if I had 130 grand to spend, which is a ton of money, the Cayenne Turbo Coupe would be actually near the top of my list, which sounds crazy considering all the supercars and sports cars you can buy. But it's so versatile and it's just like, you can drive it normally day to day and you can carve up corners the next minute. It's weird to see Porsche dive into that, considering their heritage and considering what they've done in the past for them to sort of take on BMW and Mercedes-Benz is strange, but I think they've done it better than both of them. I think the Cayenne Coupe looks a lot better. I think the interior is a lot better. Uh, and I think it drives better, I guess. I haven't really driven the X6 or the GLC, but genuinely... Porsche products just feel more composed than the BMWs and the Mercedes in terms of performance. The concept of it being called a coupe, though, I guess this kind of spans to all of them, is nonsense. It's ridiculous. And I like to poke and prod at people on, on Twitter. And so I think my tweet from the event was, driving a coupe. And then I just put pictures of the, you know, Cayenne coupe. And, of course, people were, you know tweeting at me and messing with me like that's a sedan or that's an SUV that's a crossover well that's because you're a troll but that's also funny I, the, but the question I have is like does that argument 
matter? Is it a coupe? Is it not a coupe? What it is is an adaptation of an SUV. You just said it yourself. They knock out some of the practicality with how they slope the roof. But in this instance, I think the Cayenne Coupe is the first one of these weird science experiments that actually looks better. It looks good. And we can all take a deep breath and actually admit that. Yeah, I think it looks better than the standard Cayenne, which is crazy because the X6 and the GLC Coupe are pretty ugly. <laughs> so, uh, but it works. I mean, it's the only issue I have with it is that it's ten thousand dollars more expensive uh, in each trim than the standard Cayenne, which is kind of an issue. I mean, and one hundred thirty grand is a lot to pay for a crossover. Um, but the people who want this will buy it. There's no doubt that they're going to sell a ton of these. And to your point about the sloped roof line, it's really not that dramatic in the Cayenne, uh, and at least not as dramatic as it is in the X6 and GLC and some of the others. So they actually lowered the back seat, I think, by like an inch and a half. And I'm six foot, and I sat back there super comfortably. Um, and you can even get like sport bucket seats. It's like a rear bench with like two seats that are bolstered. Um, but those are awesome. Those That's the way to go. And... Yeah, it's, it's hard to hate it. I mean, you can hate the name, but it's really hard to hate the vehicle as a whole. And Chris, you and I have yet to drive the uh, the Cayenne Coupe, so we'll withhold strong opinions. I haven't even seen it in the metal yet. Um, but we have covered pretty extensively as of late, I want to say, a car, or really it's a hypothetical car still in this moment, and that's the BMW X8. So it is this potential crossover coupe that's based on the X7, which is, of course, now the largest SUV in BMW's lineup. And this idea of the X8 kind of carves into this niche a little further, and it it creates this empty space for a massive version of one of these SUV coupes. What do you think about the idea of that car, Chris? I know as an auto enthusiast, I'm supposed to hate SUVs and crossovers and the idea of crossover coupes, but I mean, Jeff is exactly right. The The modern crop, and especially that Cayenne, is so versatile. It can it can do so many things so well. It's, it's hard to not at least say, okay, props, well done. And that's really where the segment is kind of going. And the BMW X8, you know what? It'll, it'll probably sell. It'll probably sell because... Everybody now, it seems like they're realizing what I just said. You know what? These vehicles kind of do do everything pretty darn well. The BMW X8 is going to be slightly large. Um, By slightly, I mean massively large. Um, I believe, aren't we expecting that to possibly be a three-row crossover coupe? I don't think we've, we've seen one of those yet, have we? No, I'm glad you brought up that point. No, we haven't. There's no confirmation either way. There's really no official confirmation that the car exists. BMW has gone on record saying that hypothetically there's room in the lineup for such a vehicle. um, And that would be the flagship SUV, if you will. It would also be the most expensive SUV in their lineup. Uh, But to your point, hypothetically, yes, there is room for three rows, even with that raked uh, roofline. People will buy it. It'll be terrifically expensive but you know what lamborghini has their crossover ferrari is building a crossover we know bentley wouldn't be building their crossovers and their suvs if they weren't selling them i hate to say it but yeah i I mean the the x8 it'll be big it'll be massive and hopefully they kind of dial in the uh, the kidney grill a little bit i think with the x7 it's a little too large and in charge for my taste. <laughs> if 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 they can if they can inject a little bit of the eight series coupe into an X eight, oh man! I mean I mean that could be that could be a game changer, especially if it's a three row, sexy looking, massive crossover coupe. And I know coupe that's that's marketing speak because people aren't supposed to like SUVs or or uh, or sedans or things like that. So. There, there's a little bit of that tension there, but call it what you will. If if it comes out right and they bake it and they season it right and send it out, it could be it could be a cool as hell thing. I will agree with your point on they should inject more eight series DNA into it, which I definitely think they will. I disagree with your point that the grills should be smaller. I think at this point, 
Who cares, right? Go all out, BMW. You're, you're, you've already ruined your image, right, with the 7 Series <laughs> and the X7. Yes. Just go crazy. I mean, did they? Because I deserve to be burned at the stake for this, and I will willingly admit that. I like the grill on the X7 and the 7 Series. And my point there is that at least it's different. BMWs have looked the same for so damn long that, yeah, it's a little crazy, but it's not as egregious in person. I like it. Yeah. It's a little yeah. crazy. Come on. It's a little crazy. <laughs> Well, it I wants to eat small children. The Audi uh, Q8's not much better, right? With its big grill, just because it doesn't have the dual kidneys doesn't mean it's like a big, not a big gaping, you know, face. We're getting into grill talk here, but <laughs> Jeff, I'm going to ask you this with the crossover coupe thing, especially that you just drove this fantastically expensive Porsche. Does the price matter? I mean, we've had expensive Range Rovers for a long time now. Bentley, to Chris's point earlier, really put the exclamation point down on expensive SUVs. Hasn't that argument just gone out the window at this point? Like people are going to buy them no matter how much they cost. Yeah, people are going to buy whatever they want. I mean, if they have the money to do it, they're going to do it. I think uh, I'm not. I don't remember if it was Rolls Royce or Bentley where they said that they have not sold a stock version of their SUV. As in, every person that's come to buy one of their SUVs has customized it in some way, which means that the six-figure price tag is going up already before they even roll out of the out of the factory, which is crazy to me. So I think the same thing will happen with X8. And going back to X7 for a minute, uh, I drove the X7. I was blown away by how great that thing drives for a three-row SUV. Um, and I don't doubt that the X8 will be any worse. I mean, I think it'll be better. So it is it is what it is. People are going to spend their money on these crazy things, and companies are going to keep building them. People are, are purchasing these cars to make a statement. I, I mean, especially when you look out in Hollywood, you know, once upon a time, it was all about supercars. It was your 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 suave Lambo or your Ferrari, and um, you know, then came the Cadillac Escalade, and boo, everything changed, right? And as long as there's going to be that market out there, and the market seems stronger than ever, um, you know, last year sales started to dip a little bit for a lot of automakers, but you know what? SUVs are still just killing it. And as long as there are going to be those higher end shoppers, Jeff, that's a great point about about none of those Bentleys being just you know a basic stock vehicle. The price is already going up, and it's absolutely going to be a statement uh, for kids, for adults. Yeah, it's uh, that's not going to change, not anytime soon, at least. And with little information we do have about this potential X8, it seems like this would really be. A luxurious car and I know that's sort of a, a cop out to say because it's obvious with a car that expensive but BMW would try to differentiate the X8 a bit from the X6 and the X4 which are more uh, just sort of comfortable in the middle of the lineup they would really try to go above and beyond and differentiate this X8 I would I would really like to to see that my biggest gripe I think with the X7 aside from the grill was that you put it next to an X5 and they look really, really similar. If if we're going to talk about making a statement and trying to stand out a little bit more, for the X8 to really be a success, it has to look significantly different, I think, than the X7. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think the X7 isn't big enough, right, compared to the X5, because the X5 is such a good all-around SUV that's typically more than enough space for the average family. Um, and when I drove the X7, we had issues with second row leg room and trunk space. So it's it needs to be bigger. It needs to be bolder. It needs to be more expensive, I guess, because people are going to buy them either way. So I think the X8 could be good if, to your point, they really up the ante over the X7. Six-figure overland vehicles all the way to six-figure SUVs. We've kind of covered everything today. Um, that was a lot of fun. That brings us to the end of our show. You can follow Jeff on Twitter and Instagram at NotAboatCaptain. Mr. Chris Smith, he's around on Twitter as well. He's at CHWriting, and I'm at Clint Simone on Twitter and Instagram. Hey, uh, thank you guys so much for joining me today. Yeah, yeah no problem. Us. Thank you to all of you out there for listening, and we will see you next week on the Motor1.com podcast. <laughs>